Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and uh, we're going to do another episode called First Edition, AD&D for New Players. We haven't done these for about a month, and uh, I just wanted to pick it back up where I left off. didn't want it to go too long without uh, you know, continuing where I promised I'd say I'd pick back up. You may remember the other episodes, it's kind of an overview of the whole game, and the classes, and stats, and what things you need to pay attention to, what things you don't need to pay attention to. So for, for this episode, I thought what we do is what we promised last time was talk about the Druid. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and get that player's handbook open again. And we've got a little ambient sounds in the background for fun here. And we got a little table set up, one of the maps we did from our map drawing session, which is kind of like a, a coastal t temple ruin on the edge of a coastline. So we're just going to use some of our minis from our other uh, uh, campaign. We're using the Glacial Rift or Frost Giant Draw, so I've got the banner on the bottom for that. But let's go ahead and pop over to page 20 of the player's handbook and the first edition handbook. Now, this is something that uh, I want to kind of just go through it with you without getting uh, too much in crazy detail, but I do want to go over some of these things in fine detail. So the druid, right here at the very bottom, you got the whole cleric description here on the right-hand pane we're looking at, and over here is a druid, and the druid is a subclass of the cleric. This is one thing in the first edition that we talked about before. Assassin is a subclass of thief. The ranger and the paladin is a subclass of fighter. It doesn't really matter. It really... That means they're thematically similar, like the same hit dice, you usually use the same type of weapons, maybe share some of the same spells, just like the illusionist is a subclass of the magic user for, you know, something like that. But what really matters is uh, all the things that make them unique, and I love the druid. And I tell you it's very funny, because when I first played D&D, I loved the illusionist, and I loved the thief, and I loved the fighter. Um, I never really played clerics too much, but... Later years in life, when I played EverQuest 1, I was like, oh my god, the Druid in EverQuest 1 was a riot, because you really had to play like the original Druid. So when they first made the first EverQuest game, they really kind of took the original Druid and tied it in pretty closely. In Neverwinter Nights 1, the Druid was okay, but not great. But oddly enough, in uh, using the 3.5 rule set, the Druid in Neverwinter Nights 2, um, one of the games made by Obsidian and Terran with the worst camera system in the game industry ever created. Shame on you, Sir uh, Fergus Urquhart. But uh, despite that, the Druid and uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, Mask of Betrayer, and all the other ones are really, really well done. So what I'm going to do here is let's just take a look at the Druid right here on page 20, and we'll go through some of the really powerful spells, and maybe we'll mess around with this and give you a sense. We'll use this as an example for range and things like that. So as we say right here, down here below, the Druid is really um, about being in tune with nature. And so the very first description you get for main thing is this just right here. At the very bottom of page 20, all right? So they are absolute neutral. Now, some people, when you're in the first edition, the, the alignments are pretty much you're evil or you're neutral or you're good. And there's lawful good and chaotic good. And then there's lawful neutral and chaotic neutral. And there's lawful evil and chaotic evil. And those subtleties are explained really well in the back of the player's handbook. But for the druid, there's no questions. You're neutral. And you're neutral like a polar bear is neutral. You're neutral like a wolf is neutral. You're neutral like a bird is neutral. Um, this means you don't really have a sense of what's right and what's wrong. Um, you view good and evil, law and chaos as balancing forces of nature. They're necessary for the continuation of all things. So it's probably a more difficult alignment to play than anything else because none of us are actually true neutral. Uh, we aren't animals. And so to play the druid, you really need to project yourself into this observant, calm, kind of animal way of thinking, but you're also a human being. Or you're playing an elf or a half-elf, whatever you're playing. So they're a priest by nature, so they need to have a minimum wisdom of 12, which isn't all that huge. Okay, let's just pull up, uh, let's pull up our girl from our adventure, um, where our tiger nomad uh, Ket group, and this is a storyline from our other adventures. So in our party we have Mercedes, and then we have Zolorus, and then we have Elephant, you see the monk of Renjar the Assassin, and here's uh, our druid, low level druid named Felcherna. So Felcherna, she's, her wisdom is, at, uh, this is the second time we have strength, intelligence, wisdom, Dexterity, Constitution, and Charisma. So Wisdom for her is 17, which is really strong. So you need a minimum charisma, of, uh, a minimum Wisdom of 12 and a Charisma of 15. So to play a... Uh, her Charisma barely meets that requirement. So the Charisma aspect. I mean, it's not Snow White with the Seven Dwarves and singing to little birdies and being happy. It's not about being cute. Um, the Charisma is kind of an innate sense of leadership, um, an innate sense of personality, an uh, innate sense of likability, uh, in the first edition, it's an open to all kinds of interpretation. It's not like nobility and traveler or anything like that. It's a, your ability to get along with others, inspire others. So you're really kind of a natural leader. Uh, so 15 charisma is a pretty high requirement. 
Uh, both those must attributes to exceed 15 if a druid is to gain a 10% bonus to earn experience. This is a weird rule that a lot of people don't pick up on. There's a lot of subtle little rules hidden away in one sentence in the first edition that someone should one day compile them all to a cheat sheet, like those maths, those math guides you see at the Barnes and Noble or whatever. They're trigonometry on two pages, right? So the uh, I wouldn't worry about that. What you really need to worry about, obviously, you want to have the highest wisdom possible if you're going to play a druid. Um, having additional, you want charisma at minimum 15. It certainly helps. Most DMs don't do a lot of charisma roll. I do. Um, but you're obviously going to want to have a little bit of strength and have a little constitution. So we go on to the next page. We're going to do it one column at a time here. In fact, we'll go a little bit closer. So here we go. The Druids serve to strengthen, protect, revitalize, as usual, what Cleric does. That means they're going to cast some buffs. They're going to cast some heals. Um, the more powerful Druidic spells, as well as a wider range of weaponry, make up for the fact that Druids are unable to use any armor or shields other than leather and wooden shields. Metallic armor spoils their magical power. Now, why would it spoil it? Well, you know, metal is something that's man-made. It doesn't occur in the natural world. So think about a druid that's going to be wearing armors that are made from hides. They're going to be made... Dance. You can handcraft something with thread. That's fine. But you're not going to be wearing anything made out of ores or metal that's been forged in fire. So that's really where something becomes man-made. Now, sure, someone can take a, a hide from a wolf and sew it together with a bunch of thread and string, and it becomes a man-made object, too. But it's, those, made, uh, those are an assemblage of uh, materials like an American Indian wood in the 1800s or 1700s, or Mayan wood, or any other tribal culture from Tibet would do, but they aren't forging it in fire and changing the shape of the form of the material. So that's one thing about Druids, they're using wooden shields, and they're going to use leather armor. Um, they certainly can use jewelry and things that are, that are created and crafted. Those are considered magical items. So on their whole body, the way they move through the environment, they can pass without a trace. They don't leave a trail behind them. They're not going to wear anything that's going to make any metal or make any noises on them. There's nothing wrong with having dangly feather bits or all kinds of things like that. For example, this character here, which is actually my Black Desert Online archer character in one of their custom outfits. This is pretty appropriate for a druid outfit, except for this is a little too revealing. But besides that, the whole um, capturing the theme of uh, outdoor, uh, at tune with nature, kind of like the Celts were in the Roman Empire era. Everything's crafted from what you have in the world environment. So... They must speak or read spells aloud. That means they don't cast any spells where they just use incantations with their hands. That's an interesting point. There are some illusionist spells where the illusionists with high dexterity, illusionists can, you know, do some incantations with their hand like this and wham, something comes out, right? Like we saw that in one of our episodes recently where she was casting, uh, oh, what was it, hypnotic pattern or something. I think it was hypnotic pattern. So for the druid, you need to think of the fact that she's reading the spell from a book, which is kind of unusual, or she's reciting the spell out loud. So, due to their involvement with living, growing things, druids have no power to turn or control dead demons and devils. So, the cleric, um, in our adventure, and Tola, this is this fellow here, the Tola's the cleric, and this is Felcherna the druid. Let's compare the two of them's character sheets real quick. So, here's Felcherna. You can see her saving throws and things like that. She has no innate ability to turn undead, whereas Entola can do that because he's a typical cleric. So a cleric is heavily armored, wearing plate mail, uses a shield, uses lots of bludgeoning weapons. But the druid is using scimitars and carrying shields, wearing leather armor. But she does not they don't turn undead. So a cleric is more of a representative, like a priest might be, um, a, the balance between good and evil. Whether you're evil or good, it doesn't matter. But for the druid, you're right smack in the middle of the animal kingdom, the plant world, the natural world. So... For them, they are not interested in de defending the world against devils and demons or turning undead things away from them. So, here's another interesting uh, description here when this is written, although I don't like the word, you know, can be is something I don't like to, to avoid. The form of the verb to be is really dangerous in writing, but Druids can be visualized as medieval cousins of what were the ancient Celtic sect of Druids who had been, who had become, um, who have become, had survived the Roman conquest. So as I mentioned earlier, the Roman Empire, if you look at Warlord Games' miniatures for the armies from the Hail Caesar series, there's tons of Celts. I don't have any pictures of them here on hand, but definitely go to Warlord Games and check out their minis. They have the pure historical Druids uh, armies in there. They're fantastic. So if, they, if the Druidic groups of the Celts found in England and Ireland and Scotland had survived, and even in Germania and, and France, then that's what the idea behind the druid is in um, first edition. It's not really based on the ranger like Strider or anything from Lord of the Rings. It's really based on history. So they hold trees, particularly the oak and ash tree. The sun and the moon is their deities. So you don't have druids running around worshiping like uh, Maliki or whatever, like Druid Stewart worships who's a ranger. 
Rangers and Druids are similar, but in the sense of uh, reversing the deity, there is not going to be a human personification of a god that a Druid... So already you're starting to see every little step of the way the Druid is different, different, different. And it's very interesting to play one because they're very powerful and also very human. Mistletoe is a holy symbol for the Druid. It gives power to their spells. So, you know, having a little bit of mistletoe on hand, which is a Christmas type of a thing. Uh, mistletoe toe grows way up high in the south here. It grows way up high in some of the trees, the pecan trees. So, you know, people always talk about holding mistletoe up and kissing someone on the mistletoe. So this is an ancient, uh, you know, Mer a world history type of thing, the mysticism behind the mistletoe. So they have an obligation to protect trees and wild plants, crops, and to a lesser extent their human followers and animals. This is a really key point, an obligation. So an obligation means that if you are in a battle situation, let's just say there is, in the Glacier Rift of Frost Giant Jarl, we had a scenario where there was some winter wolves. Let's get these orcs out of the way. So a, win a pack of winter wolves are, you know, up here, sniffing around, the druid's first instinct isn't kill it. You know, that's not what they're thinking. Um, if the druid is coming up to this area here and these orcs are burning the grass away from this temple, the druid's interested in it because of the grass being burned or if the, if the orcs are chopping down this coconut tree or palm tree, she's more offended by that than she is worried about whether the ruin's being def uh, defaced. So a cleric you know, a cleric might be interested in what this culture represented in the ruins and the archaeology and things of like that and what the orcs are doing to defile this location in a holy sense, which is based on religion. But with the druid, it's based on the animal kingdom and the world around them and the plant in the natural world. So you have to remember that. You're playing a druid. You're not playing, unlike in EverQuest 1, the druid has a god, right? And a lot of them are wood elves and things like that. So th these are subtle details that make things interesting. Um... So something that causes damage to plants, like burning an area to the ground, or destroying a bunch of crops that are used for people to survive, or doing things that take away the, the natural order of things, a druid wants to protect that. Now, it doesn't mean they're a tree-hugging weirdo extremist, um, or, but they're going to view any activity that's human or demi-human that's unnecessarily antagonistic towards those things to be frowned upon. Okay, And you can take that as deep as you want to. Uh, the dungeon master can take that as deep as he wants to. So... Let's go on with this a little bit further. The druids never destroy woodlands or crops, no matter what the circumstances. We're about right here now. Even though a woods, for example, were evilly hostile, a druid would not destroy it. And this is a really interesting point. You have to remind yourself, the druid is pure neutral. So it doesn't view an orc as an enemy. It doesn't view an uh, angel or something as something positive. It just views them as another entity living in the world. A, a Lamia or any of the monsters in the Monster Manual, the Pink Foley, a Get the Yankee, whatever you have, a dragon. They're all living creatures. Now, there are some situations where some things are abominations. There's some creatures that are considered abominations in all the uh, first edition. They may view something like that as purely, you know, antagonistic and horrible. But druids don't run around going, oh, look, there's a bunch of bugbears. Kill them immediately. Now, the druids are interested in protecting their party. And the druid understands that, you know, bugbears by trade and orcs by trade are filthy, gross creatures that do bad things against animals and do bad things against the natural world. So the druid doesn't like them because of those actions, not just because of who they are as an orc, okay? So they don't really have, like, a racial hatred towards one, but they may have a wish or distaste because of previous behavior of those uh, races. So even, uh, let's go down here. Uh, even though it would, for example... Uh, were evilly hostile, druids would not destroy it, although nothing would prevent them from changing the nature of the place if desired where that existed. Um, in a similar fashion, they avoid slaying wild animals or even domesticated ones, except as necessary for self-preservation and sustenance. So, you're starting to get the theme of the druid now. So, the dream's kind of like, if you imagine someone living off the land in the 1500s, um, and there was no one around you, and you're an American Indian, an American Indian would be a druid. Um, I think that's a fantastic analogy, living off the whether you're in the Great Plains or the Seminoles or wherever you are, Appalachians, whatever, the Medina, uh, Adena tribes way back from the prehistoric era, the Devil Druid, you're living off the land, you're bowing everything in versus good versus evil, not really into deities and gods and things like that. So this makes this class very interesting. If the Druids need to observe any creature destroying their charges, which means the things they believe in, the Druids are unlikely to risk their lives to prevent the destruction. Rather, it's probably the Druid will seek retribution or revenge at a later date. This is a really key point here. That doesn't mean, a, you know, you all heard about people who are really uh, activists, right? In the modern day world, even in the 80s and the 90s, activists that are trying to stop whalers in Japan from killing whales or killing dolphins. They do crazy things like jump on a boat and throw yourself onto the boat or tie yourself to the tree so you can't bulldoze the tree where they're building a new Walmart. That stuff is considered to be uh, reckless. 
So a druid doesn't do that. A druid would observe this and remember this and then take retribution upon you. So that's a little conniving. That's one thing about the druid I always liked. It was an intelligent way of dealing with things in life that are not good and uh, they're not bad, um, that are good and bad, not as opposed to reactionary. So this is a really key paragraph in Gary Gygax first wrote this. Uh, they'll seek retribution or revenge at a later date when the opportunity presents itself. So that's rather uh, conniving. You would think they'd almost be a little chaotic neutral, but that's not really what they're all about. And let's go down a little further here. In connection with their nature worship, meaning they worship or believe in nature, they don't pray to it, but they understand what it is. Druids have a certain innate powers which are gained at higher levels. At third level, which is the initiate of the first circle, um, the druid gains the following abilities. Identification of a plant type, identification of an animal type, and identification of pure water. Now, these are minor little dungeoneering, adventuring things. And identification of a plant type. Okay, let's say you have a bunch of party members. They land on this beach. There was a big massive battle and you killed a bunch of orcs. Say there was a 200 orcs here. You killed them all. A lot of people are wounded. A lot of people are damaged. Maybe the cleric is uh, real, almost near death. He's at two hit points. He's bleeding to death. The druid would be able to go in the local area and identify any kind of plants that might stop the bleeding. Or which plants are poisonous. Or which flowers would be able to mask their scent so something can't smell them. So... You could be a lot of improvisational tracker type of Lewis and Clark type vibe going on. Uh, identification of animal type means any creature in any of the monster manuals that's an animal, okay? Um, they'd be able to identify. In fact, I'd take a risk here, and let me just pull a PDF of one of the monster manuals and see if we can give you an example. Let's just pull something out of out of nowhere here. Bear with me a minute while I pull this up. I don't have it formatted for the screen, but I can pull it up for us pretty quick here. Let's see here. You know, I'm going to move this out of the way here first. What was that? Okay. Okay, where's our core books? Here we go, here we go. Start with lay. Okay, first edition. In fact, let's just pull up something from The Fiend Folio, one of my absolute favorite books of all time. Absolute favorite. Absolute favorite. Let's just move this out of the way here. So it's terrible. Let me just change this view to show the pages. Let's just show high to do the navigation panes for thumbnails. That'll help it reformat better. There we go. Sorry for the delay there. And let's just randomly pick some random page here in the middle of The Fiend Folio. The Fiend Folio was a, a monster guide uh, dungeon first edition book made that's all from the United Kingdom and the stuff in here is fantastic so what about this Pernicon this creature here this crazy looking grasshopper looks like something from Watership Down or something this is a rare armor class it's a brightly colored insect so that would be considered you know an animal so this Pernicon a druid would be able to identify this creature and know what it is whereas something down here like this Quagoth what is this it's, it's little known these great white shaggy bipeds that's more like a demi-human but this quipper, they would know what that is. They wouldn't know what this quillon is, whatever you pronounce that. Or right, let's go down even further. Let's go down to these things here. They wouldn't be able to know what these are because these are little demi-humans, right? And let's take a chance. This, but this tabaxi, they would probably know what that is. You know, it's half and half. Um, they might be able to identify like this, this rock worm. They would know what that is, what it's after, what it wants to do. Or they know what this creature is here. They might understand what a tiger fly is. Um, they certainly wouldn't know what this, they would know what these are if they bump into them, but they wouldn't know, know what it is exactly. Or like these tweens and spirituals, they may not be able to identify those at all. In fact, let's go down here really deep. Uh, you gotta love Jeff D stuff. He's still active in some of the Facebook groups too. Um, this Zill, I mean, that's a monstrous creature. So, you know, that, it comes in handy to have a druid on hand. Because they can identify animal types, okay? Doesn't mean monster types, it means animal types. Identification pure water, hey, if you're in a dungeon and there's a, or you're somewhere in a natural landscape and you've got a bunch of water and you want to know whether you can drink it or not, uh, they'd be able to identify that. In fact, they'd be able to uh, guide you to water as well. I would go as far as to say they could be able to tell you in the local area what's got water in it or not. The power to pass through overgrown areas, undergrowth, tangled thorns, briar patches, without leaving a discernible trail or at a normal movement rate. That is really, really neat. Now, one thing you'll see when people play the game, they don't ever make uh, terrain that's hard to navigate. Everything's always a simple path. Even when I drew this map here, take a look at this map, right? What do we got? All right, what do we got right here? Let's just slide over to this table. We've got this ancient ruin 
set of stairs leading up from the beach. This is all beach down here, going up to this ruin, this kind of Mayan Aztec ruin here. So you're thinking already when I drew this, I'm designing this as if people built it. But if the druid wanted to, the druid could just go up on these rocks and just go right to here. And if this was all covered with overgrowth and vines or kudzu or thorns, the druid could just go right through this at a normal movement rate. So if the druid, let's just say this area around this palm tree was just overcut, overcome with mango groves. If you know what a mangrove is from Florida, they're a big heavy root that just grows and all this is mangroves, right? So the druid, have you ever seen, uh, what's that guy, Bear Gorillas, who does his shows where he goes and survives the wilderness? You watch some of the ones with him when the mangrove is crazy. So say the druid is being chased, you want to retreat, she could retreat through the mangrove at a normal move rate. These orcs would get tied up, they probably end up moving at five feet. She just moved right through here without them even seeing her. Sounds kind of silly. It doesn't come up often. And the reason why it doesn't come up often is because that's the only class in the game that can do that. There's no magic items that let you do this. Uh, the thief can't do it. They can climb walls. The druid can't climb walls. But they can pass without a trace. The key part to that that's really useful is moving unhindered. So you may find some situations in some dungeons and modules where you're playing with your friends where there is a bunch of seaweed and there's a kelpie and the druid could just move right through that. No problem at all. Or there is a bunch of vines and a forest. You want the druid to go ahead and scout. Well, no one's going to leave a trail. The, sure, the, the thief or the assassin could hide in shadows and move silently. In fact, let's just take a look at that right here, right? Did we close our group down? No, we still have it open. If the monk can move at a high movement rate. And she could do some of the thieving abilities, which is this down here, open locks, find or remove traps, move silently, hide in shadows, hear noise, and climb walls. 99% to climb walls, but the druid, she can pass without trace. So that's something to me, you may hear me mention in some of the adventures I run for the in G1 and G2, where the druid is moving, she's intentionally trying to move stealthily, she can pass without trace. That also means to me, think of an American Indian hunter hunting for buffalo move almost absolutely silently under any circumstances. Not necessarily concealed from view, though. Not be able to hide in the shadows. You might be able to conceal yourself if you sit still, but not do that. So think about those kinds of things and add additional details to your game when you're playing a druid. This being able to move unhindered at normal movement rate, that's incredible. If you're a druid, you can use that to your a tremendous advantage, okay? At seventh level, which they call initiative of the fifth circle, you gain these additional powers. Immunity from charm cast by any creature basically associated with the woodland. So it doesn't mean charm person cast by an enemy spellcaster. It means if any kind of a um, creature like, a, well, like a Kelpie. We mentioned a Kelpie earlier. I can't remember which book she's in, but, you know, something, our siren or something that's going to try to charm you. Um, she'd be immune to that if it's a woodland creature, any creature associated with the woodlands. So it, like a dryad or Nixie or Silphy. Um, but if a magic user or an orc mage or an ogre magi cast that, charm person that's not going to do anything for her so she's not immune to charm across the board she's immune to charm cast by any kind of woodland creatures because it's an innate ability from them so it wouldn't work on her let's go to number two here ability change form up to three times per day actually becoming in all respects save for her mind meaning her intelligence a reptile bird or mammal so just think about that for a minute you can become a hummingbird fly extremely high extremely fast undetected you can become a hawk and see really far you can become an owl and see at night you could become a crocodile and swim underwater, hold your breath for an hour. You could be a dolphin. You could change yourself into the shape of a, um, a, a whale, uh, an octopus, a fish. Um, oh my goodness, it just goes crazy. I, I, the bird part's fantastic. I mean, that means you can, you can be a seagull and fly over the landscape and be undetected. Be able to shape shift, that's fantastic. Let's go into details of this. Each type of creature form can be shared only uh, once per day. And so, up to three times a day. It's very interesting here. Ability to change form up to three times a day, actually becoming all respects except for your mind, a reptile, bird, or mammal. Each type of creature form can be assumed but once per day. So read that carefully. So this means reptile, bird, or mammal. So in one day, you can shape shift into an alligator and then go out of alligator into a seagull and then out of a seagull into an otter or a wolf. But you couldn't go wolf to otter in the same day. So it's kind of shifting between different shapes. That's a detail that most people don't remember. When you get in playing a lot of MMOs and shape shifting like the Druid and WoW, which is a totally carnival mode, um, you're just shape shifting all the time into bear form or cat form or travel form, flight form. But it's different for this one. So this is a very, very, very creative ability that works underground too. 
So, and also, you can change your size. So if you want to, you know, shapeshift into some kind of a small little creature that's a little, like a little mouse, you can crawl underneath the door in a fire giant hall and go peek in the next room. Hopefully they won't crush you and kill you. Um, but you still have your intelligence. You can even try casting spells. This is an area for debate. When you're shapeshifted, can you or can you not cast spells? Um, if you start to cast a spell, it would probably take you out of the shapeshifted form. Um, they say you can't, uh, there may be some more details here that mention that. But let's see what you have here. So we did the number of times a day. The size of the creature form can vary from as large as a bullfrog, a blue jay, or a bat as large as a snake, eagle, or black bear, about double the weight of the druid. So what I was saying earlier, you could shape shift into a whale or an elephant. You probably couldn't do that. They say twice the weight of the druid, but I personally don't have a problem with it. I think if you're going to play a druid and you want to shape shift into another creature that's like a magical ability, it's not like you're, you're like almost like a self polymorph. Um, I don't, would have a, a black bear that's going to weigh 800 pounds. That's way more than twice the weight of a druid. So they're trying to say you're not shape shifting into something that's gigantic, you know. Um, I don't have a problem with that, though. Am I, I mean, if you're going to shape shift into a whale, yeah, okay, maybe you're like the size of a little blue whale that's one year old. Um, the next one is the, with its, each assumption of a new form removes 10% to 60%. So you'd have to roll a d6, right, and multiply by 10. So in that situation, that's a 5 times 10 would be 50% of your hit points. Um, if, if any, the druid sustained prior to changing form. So let's read that carefully. Each assumption of a new form removes um, the, uh, the hit points of damage. Okay, so say you have a druid. Let's look at Felchurn again. Say she's wounded and she's at 80 health and she's at 40 health now. So she say she shapeshifts into the shape of a wolf to run away. Little d6. That's 5. She gains 50% of her health back. So in that situation, she would get 50% of her lost hit points back. Not 50% of her total health back, but 50% of her lost hit points. So if she was 80 and went down to 40, means she's only lost 40. Half of that's going to be 20, so she would put her back up to 60. So that's an interesting rule. So you can use the shape-shifting to self-heal to tremendous amounts based on the D6 roll. So it's only the damage sustained prior to changing form. Okay? This is a nice one, too. Druids have their own secret language, and all speak it in addition to the other tongues. Alignment, common, others known. That means they speak neutral, they speak common tongue, any other language you picked up. Upon coming a level third druid, and with each level increase thereafter, the druid gains a language of their choice. Centaur, Dryad, Elvish, Fawn, Gnome, Green Dragon, Hill Giant, Lizard Man, Manicor, Nixie, Pixie, Spirit, and Treant. So this is one of those rules where when this book was written, Monster Manual 2 wasn't out yet, Theme Folio wasn't out yet, so you would need to append and add to that. Um, in this situation, they've only chosen green dragon because it's considered like an outdoor or natural world dragon. It doesn't mean you can turn, you can read what a, a white dragon could say. In melee combat, the druids fight as a cleric. That means if you use your DM screen to roll the hits, it's on the same table as, uh, excuse me, as the cleric. Um, they, are, they suffer somewhat to make their inability to wear protective armors of metal. That means their armor classes aren't as good. They make saving throws as a cleric, which are really good. They save against fire and lightning, electrical as if they get a bonus of plus two to their dice rolls. That's kind of like a natural ability of them. Druids can use magic not otherwise prescribed, which are for all classes. Regular cleric is not written. Um, so uh, let's say that uh, so druid can use those magic items not otherwise prescribed for all the classes for regular clerics, which are not when and which are not written. It affects books and scrolls. So let's say you have a book and it's not it's not otherwise prescribed as a cleric book or a uh, fighter book or something like that thief book then they can use that at the upper levels there are only a limited uh, number of characters at 12th level drew can be but nine of these as nature's priests this is a rule I don't ever follow we never did that we never enjoyed that we always liked our world to be uh, limitless in what could happen they have a lot of rules in the first edition that kind of say they can only be up to 12 druids in one nation at one time I didn't think that was strong enough so we got rid of that we never used that um, but what they're trying to do is tie into the mythology of there can only be like one pope or something, you know, or cardinals. Now, level 12 isn't that big of a deal in first edition um, when you get to some of the high-level stuff. Like Vault of the Drow, if you're Vault of the Drow, run around level 12, you're going to get blown open and killed. So these kind of rules are interesting and exciting for the mythology of the class when it was first created. But in all practical purposes, it's not very usable. This is one of the problems with some of the other things in first edition. Like some classes going level to level 6 if they're playing a gnome. Um, those kinds of rules, I think they kind of remove the fun for playing the game for the long term. I don't think there should ever be a level cap beyond maybe level 20. Um, and I don't think there should be a problem with someone having multiple druids at high levels in the same campaign. Excuse me, I need a little glass of water here.
Now, one thing in the first edition they talk a lot about, but no one really plays a lot, is this kind of stuff about henchmen and hirelings. In the first edition, they kind of wanted, they kind of expected you, and they have a lot of rules for uh, the player hiring men at arms and or women at arms or shield maidens or whatever you want to do to come with you and help you in the dungeon. They're always like these, you know, willing to break morale at a moment's notice. Uh, cannon fodder, want to cut of the money because um, you're playing kind of a heroic character. That's kind of a carryover from wargaming. Most people who play D&D &D don't run around with a lot of hirelings. We did a lot when we were little kids, but over time it became a pain in the butt. Um, if you play some of the Baldur's Gate games, you can see that lots of NPCs will join your party. I think that's great. An interesting NPC joining your party is fine. Even in uh, Steading of the Hill Giant Chief, there's characters locked away in the prison down in the second level that are like there's a gnome architect, I think, and there's a, um, I think there's an elf magic user you could rescue, and they join the party with you. Those things are really useful too, excuse me. But not a bunch of hirelings. And you could do that if you really wanted to, but it just bogs everything down. Um... Let's go down to, this is just a list of the spells you can use. So say you're level 8 druid, you get you can learn 4 first level, 4 second level, 3 third levels, 2 fourth. Uh, and it's also you have a bonus from your wisdom. Let's pull this out just a little bit and go down to this next page here. And then we're almost about to jump in the fighter. So let's go down to here. The last rule, once again, is about some of this uh, um, hireling long-term goals in life like this right here druids are a class that do not dwell permanently in castles or even in cities or towns they, will, they live prefer to live in sacred areas dwelling in the sod log or stone building of the smallest size attaining level of level and care generally inhabit building complexes set in woodlands and similar natural surroundings so there you have it that's all you get for the thematic elements for the druid now the real fun part for this class is some of the spells i'm going to go through them relatively briefly not an elaborate detail there's our monk table Let's go down to here. In fact, we'll just do a control F and do a search for the... Let's do a search for hold person. Okay, there we go. So, you get to around page, uh, page 40. We start getting to all the spells. These are the cleric spells. Here's the druid ones. Let's just look at this a little closer here. I'm not going to go through every single one of them in detail, but a lot of them are very um, role-playing game-specific when you're trying to discover information or figure things out, as opposed to just blowing things up with fireball. So things like, well, they can be very, very powerful if they use appropriate, like Animal Friendship. I mean, a level one spell, if you cast Animal Friendship on a Winter Wolf, you're gonna have an ally. Uh, detect Magic is always useful. D d detect Snares and Pits, great if you don't have a Thief. Entangle is extremely powerful. If you watch one of our episodes um, where we fought the White Dragon, I think we threw an Entangle down. And also in the Steading of the Hill Giant Chief, we threw an Entangle down. This is a really nasty spell. In fact, before we go any further, let's just go to it right away and let you see how powerful it is. It may be one of the situations where um, it's a cleric spell, but it's... Let's just type that in here. Entangle. There it is. The once entry. Let's go to the second entry. Speak with plants. Here it is. Entangle. This is nasty. It's an alteration, which means you're changing the world around you. Look at this range. It's an 80 foot range. It lasts a turn, 10 minutes. It's a 40 foot diameter, not radius. Saving throw means half. So it means this spell the Drew is able to cause plants in the area of effect to entangle creatures within this area. The grasses, weeds, bushes, and even trees warp and twist and entwine about the creature, thus holding them fast for the duration of spell. If any creature in the area of effect makes a saving throw, they just slow their movement by 50% spell duration. I remember playing Never Nights 1. And that was an incredible, and even in Never Nights 2, that is an incredible spell to use before you do Insect Swarm and some of the other area effect spells like Call Lightning. Let's just do an example here. Say this druid here, say she can see this orc right here, the line of sight through here, and she casts Entangle in here. Here's 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, that's the diameter. Let's do 10, 20. This is about this radius of this Entangle spell. That means every single thing in this area, if they tried moving, even if they've made all, they didn't make their saving throw, they can't move. They'd be like rooted in place, their roots hold them in place like this. But if they don't make their saving, they're going to be moving at half movement rate. Which, and then the druid can also move through. This is all mangroves that we talked about before. She can move freely through this. So the entangle spell is kind of a defensive spell, but you could also do something like that to hold everything in place and then start casting call lightning, which is a channeled spell which does tons and tons and tons of damage. So let's go back to our uh, main spell list again. Here we go. So uh, 
Fairy Fire is a nice one. If you read any Drift Stewart and books, you know about that one. Invisibility of Animals is interesting. It's not that awesome, but if you wanted to go somewhere with a lot of evil uh, animals and polar bears or wolves or dire wolves, not all animals are happy and friendly. Uh, being, being, having them unable to see you is nice, but you have to also remember that a lot of animals can smell you, so they can tell something's going on. So you could have, remember, if you're playing a game session, you got these, say you had some... Uh, Here's some wolves here, right? So you got some dire wolves or something. Here's some wolves. Say there was a bunch of wolves in this little area here. The druid cast everyone else is hidden down here. And you cast this invisibility animals. And she can pass out trace. But it doesn't mean her scent is completely obscured. It would think about as a dungeon master, like which way the wind's blowing. They may not see her, but they might smell her. And if they smell her, they might think she's in this area somewhere. Or the smell of her weapons and armor might have a scent to it. But they may not be able to detect where they are, but it might alert them that someone's nearby. They just can't see them. Those are the kinds of details you need to think about. Locate animals would be great. You need to find something. Pass out trace is really interesting. This is a really good spell. Let's just check that one out real quick. Here we go. Let's do this one here. This one's a really good one. These are low-low ones. I'm not going to do all of them. It's going to do the ones that really jump out. When this spell is cast, the recipient can move through any type of terrain, mud, snow, dust, and leave neither footprint nor scent. Thus, tracking a person or other creature covered by the Dwemer is impossible. The material component spell will leave a mistletoe, blah, 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 and the air which passed over the radiate a Dwemer for six to 36 turns after. 36 turns is 36 10-minute intervals. So that's like six hours or something, I believe. So this means you would leave no trail at all. So, at all. So the effect is a person touched. So let's say that you wanted to, say you had a big barbarian in your party like this guy right here. You wanted to cast a pass without trace on him. And let's say he had his own ring of invisibility, right? So he could move around invisible and leave no footprints and leave no trail at all in this entire area and investigate the whole area and come back and it'd be less likely to be detected. He might be smelled by these wolves Right, but he, but these say there was some. Let's just put some. Let's just put some hill giants up there for fun, because we happen to have some hill giants. Say there were some hill giants here. They don't smell anything. They're just dummies, right? Big dummies. Not only is a barbarian type character not going to be able to move silently or anything, pass out trace. He might make noises. These guys will look around. They won't know what it is, such as the ocean, the sea, making sounds in the background. But he leaves no footsteps. So you could walk right next to someone here and it wouldn't leave any footsteps. They might make footstep sounds, but the hill giant's too dumb to figure out what's going on with it. So that's a really useful spell if you use it in a creative way. And let's go back to our, uh, let's put this back to 75. Let's go back up to here again. All right. So that one's really great. Pass that trace. Predict weather. Eh. Purify water. Somewhat useful. Chile is an interesting spell. Speak with animals. Bark skin, charm person, or mammal is great. Uh, create uh, water is fantastic. Let's go a little closer here. Let you see some of these details. Um, heat metal is interesting. Locate plants is okay. Obscurement is interesting one. This is one that we definitely want to talk about real quick. These are the kind of spells that once you start, when you start reading some of the uh, old school spells and you don't really pay attention, this one here, this spell causes a misty vapor to rise around the druid. It persists in location for four rounds per level experience. So for Felcherno, that would be 44 rounds of experience, uh, 44 rounds of duration. It reduces the visibility of any sort, including infravision, to two feet. Okay? The area effect is a cubic progression based on the druid's level experience. A one, a 10 foot, di 10 foot cube at first level, 20 foot cube at second level. So you, at this point, you have a situation where you could create a huge veil of mist that concealed your entire party that no one could see through. So your vision, you're obscured from vision. Underground, the hide the vapor is restricted to 10 feet. So underground, it can be 10 feet, but you could create a mist that covers this entire area. Now, the area effects is special, right? Um, underground, the height's restricted. We said that already. The length and the breadth of the cloud is not limited. A strong wind will cut the duration of the spell by 75%. It doesn't mean it removes it. Now, if someone cast a gust of wind spell, which a magic use spell might go away. So this is a really, really interesting spell that people don't use very often. It's almost like a, if you play war games, Fog of War, if you were to um, come to here and you saw this entire group up here and they didn't see you and you cast this spell, this mist will slowly start to come and cover this whole area. That might be a great way for your monk and your assassin to hide in shadows and freely move up here and move around and just systematically start backstabbing and killing everyone. 
and that's really nasty. But this guy here, say this guy's at the top of the steps, this guy's here, and say that the say that Avenger wanted to backstab him and Elephantisi wanted to try to stun this guy, they wouldn't even be able to even see you. Now, it doesn't mean that they can see them either because it's a, the, the, the mist obscures everyone's view. But if they saw where they were ahead of time and they were going to the area, they'd be able to detect them before they could detect them probably pretty easily. That one's really, really nasty. Let's go back to the uh, spell list one more time and we'll just try to wrap this up pretty quickly here. I love to go through every single one of these, but it would take forever. What I'm trying to do is convey a general theme. And the theme here we're trying to say with these two examples is you need to read through some of these spells and read carefully some of those sentences because there's some things in there that are really, really neat that you may like, wait a minute, I never actually realized that that was such a powerful spell. When you get to third level, just like the magic user, you get some nasty things. Um, it's like Fireball or Lightning Bolt, you get Call Lightning, which I believe can only be used outdoors. You get Neutralized Poison, you get Protection from Fire, Pyrotechnics is great, Snare is fantastic, uh, Stone Shape is great, Summon Insects does lots of damage, it's really brutal, Water Breathing is great. Then you start having these animal summoning spells and call a woodland being, which means summoning like a centaur or something from the world. Uh, the, uh, the protection from lightning, eh, not so much. Hold plant, hold a uh, plant is really good. Plant door is really interesting. Let's do that one real quick. Let's do the plant door. These are the ones that no one else ever, ever gets. Let's look at this one. It's one of those spells is split over two pages. So many people miss these. They don't pay attention to how good they are. And only the first of Drew Drew gets these. This is it right here, okay? This lasts one turn per level, so if you're level 10, it lasts 10 turns. That's 10 10 minute intervals. It's about two hours or so. The plant door still opens a magical portal or a passageway through trees, undergrowth thickets, or any other growth, even growth of a magical nature. The plant door is opened only to the druid who casts a spell. Druids of higher level or dryads. The door enables the druid to enter into a solid oak tree and remain hidden there until the spell ends. If the tree is cut down or burned, the druid must leave before the tree falls or consumes or they're killed also. So if you're being chased in the forest, she could open plant door and any kind of large tree, like a magical door would open, just step inside the tree. It's like something from the faraway tree. Uh, cushions, please, type deal. So this is a way, this is like complete concealment for the druid at a moment's notice in an exterior environment. And that's something that most people don't think of. They think of, oh, let me just cast a spell and do something offensive and just start nuking because they play too many MMOs all the time. So those spells there can use creatively can make a big difference on uh, how well you play your druid and how, well, um, how things work out for you. Let's go look at these a little bit more detailed here. Evolutionary Forest is fantastic. Um, repel Insects is useful in some situations. Animal, animal Something 2 is great. Anti-Plant Shell is great. Um, they get, you see there's a lot of uh, control winds and weather oriented spells. There's also a lot of plant spells. Stick to Snakes is fantastic. Transmute Rock to Mud. Is really useful if you want to turn a, a wall of stone or a passageway into mud. A wall of fire is a brilliant spell. Imagine casting Entangle and then casting Wall of Fire right on top of targets in a line. If you've ever played Divinity Original Sin, you know how important it is to line up some of the spells right on top of each other. So as you start playing the Druid, and you start playing like an offensive Nuker Druid because you're not a melee class, you'll realize that like between having a, an ally that's a Winter Wolf or something like that, being able to shape shift in the shape of a bird, land on top of a pillar, and cast and tangle, and start casting call lightning on everyone in the area, and put a wall of fire on top of something, suddenly you're an area effect machine, and you have to be intelligent about it. So some of these spells are really, really careful, are really well done. The wall of thorns is a fantastic defensive spell, and of course you have finger of doom. Let's just take a look at that one. That one's a uh, really nasty. Did I spell it wrong? Finger death. Excuse me. I would think of Creeping Doom. Creeping Doom is nasty. Let's do Creeping Doom first, and then we'll do Finger of Death. No, it's not a Metallica song. <laughs> Here we go. This one's really nasty. This is a high level. It's nasty. When the Druid utters the spell a Creeping Doom, she calls forth a mass of 500 to 1,000 venomous, biting, and stinging arachnids, insects, or myriapods, mir whatever that is, the carpet-like mass will swarm an area of a 20-foot square and commanded from the druid will creep forth at 1 10 feet per round towards the prey within 80 feet. Moving in any direction the druid commands, the creeping druid will slay any creature subject to normal attacks, each of the small horrors inflicting one point of damage. So imagine if you have 1,000 hit po 1,000 biting bees or wasps all attack something at once. The creeping druid right here will slay any creature subject to normal attacks. That means if you have something that's only affected by magical attacks, it won't kill them. 
but if you had like a bunch of orcs, you could just send this thing around wiping out an entire encampment. Each of the small horrors inflicts one hit point of damage each then dies. So if there's 1,000 hit points and 1,000 starts systematically dying. This is a great way to chew up something like a manticore or something that has a lot of health that uh, isn't a magical creature. So you have something entangled and they're rooted and they're held in place by wall of thorns and you got wall of fire and then you got creeping doom happening at the same time on call lightning. You are a, an area effect someone's worst nightmare. And in Never Nights 2, if you've ever played it and stuck it through the terrible camera system, spells like that are really, really nasty. As is Firestorm and Finger of Death. Uh, Finger of Death, this, then let's do the saving throw this one real quick. So the saving throw in this one's none. Okay? Creeping Doom has no saving throw. So if the Druid gets the spell off, they're going to be able to control that at will, unless the Druid gets incapacitated. That's really, really nasty. Especially with the duration of Entangle. You throw an Entangle down now and a Creeping Doom and an area effect with a company of 20 soldiers, they're going to die. There's no way they're going to make it. Uh, Finger Death has a saving throw that negates the effect. The Finger Death because the victim's heart to just stop. The Druid utters the incantation, points hit her index finger at the creature to be slain. Unless the victim succeeds making the appropriate saving throw, death occurs. A successful saving throw negates the spell. Talk about nasty. You want to take over someone's kingdom, that's a good one to have on hand. Just make sure your fingernails are clean first, right? And Firestorm, this is another one. It's, it's uh, really brilliant. It does half damage. It's almost like a fire spell from a fire dragon, a uh, red dragon. When Firestorm spell is cast by a druid, the whole area is shot through with sheets of roaring flames equal to a wall of fire. Creatures in the area of the effect 10 feet from the edge receive 2 to 16 points of damage plus additional hit points and number of levels experienced the druid. So you're level 10, another 10 points of damage. So that would be 12 to 26 damage unless they make a saving throw. This is going to continue to do this area effect. And once again, if someone's inside of Entangle, they can't move and get out of this. Really, 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 really nasty. Reincarnate to come back to life spell. You come back to life as another creature. Reincarnate someone as an animal. So the Druid, you you, you got you to gotta understand that this class is really, really, really creative and really powerful. But they're not a dungeon-crawling nuking machine. You're not a DPSer. But if you play very creatively, you can do really, really well in almost any kind of adventure. And your spells only go up to 7th level, but there's tons of spells that just pick the right ones. The thing about the Druid that's also quite interesting that I think is uh, really fun is there's some dungeons that the Druid totally excels at. And you know what? The Vault of the Drow and the, uh, the Descent to the Depths of the Earth, the Shrine of the Kuatoa, the hill, Steady Hill Giant Chief, the Glacier Earth Frost Giant Jarl, the Hall of Fire Giant King, Druids are totally suited for that campaign. Um, White Plume Mountain, Tomb of Horrors, maybe not so much. Maybe she becomes more of a nuker there. But the Druid's a fantastic class, a lot of fun to play, with a lot of really neat things at their disposal. You know, and they could use things like the Sword of Cast, which is an artifact level item as well. So in summary, if you're beating around the bush and trying to figure out what class to play, don't be lulled into thinking that playing a magic user has lots and lots and lots of spells to work with. All at the ninth spell, like Bigby's Crushing Hand, Imprisonment, and Meteor Swarm. This is a druid that can get those that kind of nasty spells like Finger of Death by level 7. In fact, let's go back to the actual list of the, the druid list for their spells. Okay, make this a little bigger here. And they're right after the cleric. It's on this side of the pane too. Right? Let's see if we can find it here first. Here's a cleric table. Here's a druid table. Imagine you want to get your Finger of Death. You want to get that spell. When are you going to get the level 7 spell? Level 12. So level 12, you'll get Finger of Death. If you're playing a magic user, and you want to get to um, a level 9 spell, let's see what level you need to be. Let's make the smaller, make it easier to find. There's the Cleric. Druid, Paladin, Ranger, Magic User. Here you go, Magic User. Let's just zoom in on this a little bit. There we go. So level 7 spell for Magic User, 14. You have to be level 14 just to get a level 7 spell. Let's see, either even a level 7 spell that somewhat even compares to that. Here's Magic Easel, 7th level. Grasping Hand, Cacodemon, that's nice. Delay Blast, Fireball is okay. Duo Dimension, Limited Wish, that's pretty nasty. A limited Wish is very, very good. Morgan, Dian, uh, Morgan Kanan Sword, Phase Door, Power Word Stun, but it's not Power Word Kill. Later on, they're going to get Power Word Kill. That's the same thing as just make their heart stop. So the magic user gets a lot of really nice stuff, but also a lot of their spells. But in fact, let's just look at Power Word Kill real quick. Power Word uh, Kill. Do a control F and do a search. 
That's called power word. That's power word stun, okay? This is a magic user spell, okay? Saving throw none. When a power word stun is uttered, any creature of the magic user's choice will be stunned. Reeling and they will think coherently or act for blah 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 melee rounds. That's not a long duration. Of course, magic user must be facing a creature must be within the spellcaster's range of, a, of 5 feet per level. So if you're level 10, that's, low, that's 50 feet away. Creatures with 1 to 30 hit points will be stunned for this round. So say you had a 90 health uh, frost, 80, 80 health uh, frost giant. So here we go. From 61 to 90, it will be stunned for 1 to 4 rounds. Creature of 90 hit points will not be affected. Note that the creatures are weakened to any cause the hit points below the usual max of the current number of hit points possessed will be used. So if you had something, you had a frost, you had a white dragon, you're fighting a, a grand ancient frost dragon or a white dragon, and you had it from 250 health all the way down to 70 health, then you would use this range that's marked right here. That's a pretty good spell, but it doesn't kill anything. It just stuns them. A lot of creatures are going to live through those kinds of stuns. So the druid, really creative, not a walking wave of nuking destruction unless you play it right. So if they have the chance and they have the opportunity to get some of their area effect spells off, they're going to destroy a lot of things really quickly. If you ever can put stand it and get up and uh, put up with it, um, and you like computer games, I encourage you to play uh, Neuronites 2 sometime. You know, it's totally dated now and all the patches are buried on the internet. It's hard to get to them. Uh, even Neuronites 1. And try playing a druid. Play a pure druid, wear leather armor, get a scimitar, put a shield on, get some uh, you know, a cloak of protection, get a ring of protection, or get some uh, other deflection bonus gear. It's, it's rules 3.5. And try playing a druid and realize once you start hitting some of the higher levels and you come into a room, you've got six drow on screen, and you get an entanglement off, and you start casting um, <laughs> some nasty spells like Call Lightning or Finger of Death. Or, you know, the, you're just going to be like, oh my goodness, this class is really, really powerful. Now, you don't have a lot of health, but you have more health than a magic user. You get a D8 for hit points. Anyway, so we want to wrap this up here really quick here, but that's the one the class I love. I've always loved that class. I found some of the other ones to be good old standbys, but the Druid's really, really fun. requires a lot of creativity to play, and I hope you've enjoyed this recording, this uh, video, and if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to ask. The Druid's changed a lot over the years, but the, in Pathfinder, they kept her pretty much the same. Um, but for uh, a new player getting the first edition, I encourage you to try playing the Druid. And this one, the beauties of the first edition is a lot of these spells are open to interpretation. Your creativity is what makes it fun and exciting. It's not telling you exactly what's going to happen or exactly what you should do or how much damage the spell does. not like playing World of Warcraft. So be creative. Think creatively. Have fun. Try a new class. Try the Druid. Love them to death. They're fantastic. Take care. We'll talk to you real soon. This is a classic DM. Learn how to play first edition.